And I say that the big trend of 2021 is to upskill, upskill. Even if you're in a job right now and you feel safe, upskill. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Tell you what, do you feel like cracking the code of 2021? Well, if so, you've come to the right place. Today's show is all about the economic recovery occurring at a global level, the good, the bad, the ugly. How will real estate perform in a very crowded asset marketplace What does the future of 2021 look like? On today's show, at a glance, we're going to go through lots of interesting economic data to reveal what 2021 may just look like. Tell you what, if you love understanding financial systems, the risks we face at a global level, and of course, how Australian and New Zealand household finances are faring in what has been a very tumultuous 2020, well, today's show is going to help unveil what the recovery and the road to recovery looks like. Most businesses in Australia have gone into the pandemic with low debt levels, but what does it really look like now with the jobless jobless rate return to normal? Will we have a very strong financial future in both Australia and New Zealand? Today's show is all about cracking these codes. And I tell you what, I'm pumped to do today's show. I secretly love talking about economics. I'm a bush economist. And for me, I think sometimes just understanding some little delicate nuances about how money works can absolutely help you make the courageous decision to build a multi-million dollar property portfolio, which of course is why we do this. We want to free ourselves up financially and listening to economic information can be as boring as batshit, but I am here to tell you I'm going to make it fun. I guarantee you by the end of this podcast, you're going to walk away with some value bombs, but also feeling pretty safe and secure about the future of Australia and New Zealand real estate. Now, let's get started. I tell you what, the first rule I think you should learn as an investor of any type is to understand context of investing. Sometimes I feel like I have conversations with real estate investors who really don't have the context to have conversations because they don't understand other asset classes. There is no compared to what. See, in real assets, there are versions of investment. You can put money in cash. You can put money in government bonds. You can put money in credit. Real assets like real estate or equities, shares and so forth. And I think it's probably fair to say due to the low cost of money, most asset classes are being reshaped. In fact, because of the cost of money, cash is worthless. Government bonds are also worthless. And credit is very interesting. Property investors can buy credit from the bank at ridiculously low rates and actually rent that credit out and create a dividend from buying and renting credit. Real estate assets, of course, are going to inflate. You've got so much money circling around, the cost of money has dropped, and that is going to create an artificial growth rate, which will see real assets being worth more. The valuation of real estate will become worth more. So if you own real estate, you can just kick back, relax, Buckle up and go for the ride. If you don't own real estate or you don't have enough of it, you've got to get in the market because money is anchored to the cost of cash and assets are anchored to money. So money is cheap. So that means real estate assets are going to go up. 
as will equities. And some do say equities are overpriced at the moment. So where do I see the real value as an investor? Definitely not in cash, definitely not in government bonds, definitely buying credit and real assets, real estate. What we have yet to see, which is so phenomenal, that in 2020, we saw in both Australia and New Zealand for the first time, a thing known as quantitative easing, QE. Quantitative easing, if you don't really understand it, is really the idea that our central banks printed money. They printed so much money and bought so many government bonds back that they are now flushed with so much cash. So central banks then give that money at a very low rate to our major banks. So in Australia and New Zealand, our big major banks, BNZ, NAB, uh, Westpac, CBA, ANZ, these banks now have more cash than you can poke a stick at. In 2021, those banks have access to over $240 billion more dollars of real cash that they've got to get out of their bank and into your back pocket. That is real liquidity. See, we are now seeing the transformation of money, folks. And 2021 is really the big vaccine year, but also the vaccine of cash. In fact, 2020, really the quantitative easing of money really didn't come through the system for through the banks. It came through government. And now the banks have their turn. And what we will see is an amazing transformation of more money floating around the economy than ever before. Really, you as an investor just need to make the decision whether you want some of that cash and you want to do something with it, like leverage into the real estate market or even into the equities market. Now, I'll tell you what, Australia and New Zealand have dodged a bit of a bullet. It's probably fair to say we are the envy of the entire world based on little to no corona. But how is the rest of the world faring? And I think when we look at the globe, there are some winners and losers from an economic overview that will see a continued low deflation rate around the entire globe. Really, Australia and New Zealand have flattened the curve to virtually a non-existent caseload of coronavirus. In fact, other economies are also doing pretty well. Places like China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam have all done really well when it has come to managing coronavirus. Those nations have seen this pandemic dynamic before. They've dealt with things like czars. However, if we think about Europe, if we think about Uh, America, if we think about the Philippines, Indonesia, India, much of these mega, mega countries of big populations are absolutely in a bit of trouble. And here in Australia, we've kind of seen this V-shaped recovery where really the economy got a shock and it was so quick, but then that shock passed with the flatlining of no corona cases to a V-shaped recovery. However, Europe and the USA is now sort of going through this wobbly, almost like W-shaped recovery where their caseloads are so out of control that the economy is going to get affected and we'll probably even need more fiscal stimulus to drive a result. Australia and New Zealand, near zero cases, and it's also fair to say 
that with the vaccine on the horizon, Australia and New Zealand going into summer months where generally there are less viruses and colds anyway, are looking pretty good to time this. Europe, America are literally timing it through two winters. Australia and New Zealand, just the single winter. So we are really, really well placed to lead the world economically in recovery. We are connected to Central Asia with our biggest trading partners being China and Japan, both countries, which are faring really, really well off the back of this. And I think it's really commendable to say that the hibernation strategy that both Australia and and New Zealand governments implemented has worked. It has worked. Essentially, here in Australia, the government really said at the height of the madness in early 2020, let's hibernate the economy. Let's pay people's wages. Let's keep people on JobKeeper. Let's uh, let's holiday mortgages. Let's get everyone working from home and extinguish this virus. The hibernation strategy has seemed to have worked. There is always going to be the odd outbreak, which uh, happens. But overall, the economy has fared well. The social economy has done it the hardest. The social economy... Things like restaurateurs, you know, uh, holidays, uh, airlines, that social economy has done it tough. But for most people in Australia and New Zealand, the safe harbour effect of delaying uh, challenges has worked, has worked. We were literally put in a place where our economy was frozen, the real estate economy was frozen in places like Victoria, you couldn't even open a home to sell it. So by freezing everything, we have really come out of this in a new space. And it's probably fair to say that the economy is now tiered. There's sort of two versions of the economy. On one hand, House prices and property values are starting to increase. On the other hand, rents are dropping. It's kind of like this uh, dichotomy of activity. On the other hand, we're seeing potentially job losses, uh, which are still up in the air, yet house prices are soaring in value in some neighbourhoods, very much anchored to the cost of money. You know, at the start of the... Uh, the meltdown in 2020, we saw big banks here in Australia, the Commonwealth Bank, Westpac, NAB, really put out some doomsday reports, uh, reports that real estate would drop as much as 25%. We had Harry Dent come here and do the American, uh, your, your real estate market's going to collapse to nothing. And of course, all of that has been... Uh, found out to be uh, a little bit, uh, I get, I guess, alarmist, but uh, has not occurred, thankfully. Now, it could have got worse. Uh, we could have had more outbreaks. We could have literally been unable to contain the virus, as is in Europe, as is in America, as is in India, South America, All of these big continents with huge amounts of people are suffering. So I tell you what, the fact that Westpac now has growth reports of, for example, the Brisbane property market going to do 20% capital growth in 2022 is absolutely huge. Why is that going to happen? Well, I can tell you there's 240 billion reasons why that is going to happen. It's called money in our big institutional banks that needs to find a home. Money is looking for a home. And I tell you what, the relationship with money is a big, big conversation for property investors. Money loves order. And if you can provide order to your bank, they will give you money. 
If you provide chaos to your bank, they will not give you money. And right now, your job as a human being is to get order in your life so you can go to the bank and borrow money and take that money and invest it, use it. You can rent it out and literally get a dividend. You can invest in real assets like real estate and get growth, huge amounts of growth, 20%. 20%'s like a $500,000 piece of real estate becomes a $600,000 piece of real estate. It's 100 grand, man. When was the last time you saved 100,000 bucks? Australia has done a great job at running this economy and it has hundreds of billions to still spend. Really, Australia is like a wartime economy right now. And off the back of that, you saw huge amounts of growth. Baby boomers happened after World War II. They were all about uh, regrowing the economy. Some of the biggest growth rates in the history of the Western world occurred after World War II. So don't understand underestimate what is going on here we are running a wartime economy we are spending money like the world is at war and the amazing part of that is on the other side of this really there will be winners and losers people who reached out and invested and people who didn't i tell you what Australia and New Zealand does have relatively high debt levels on face value where a property seems so expensive. You know, you go around Sydney and, you know, in a half-decent pocket of Sydney, every house is like $2.5 million. On face value, that is very expensive. But when we now look into the data the actual cost of borrowing money to service that $2.5 million worth of real estate is as cheap as it was in 1999. So money is so cheap, it is actually going to uh, be flushed through the system and it will need to go to assets. And in Australia, very much that conclusion is as part of the recovery efforts it is so important to get money out of the bank and into assets which can perform at a higher level because the money is useless in the bank so a very very uh huge amount of effort in 2021 this year is going to be about getting money out of the bank and into other asset classes. Now, many arguments do sort of pose the question that if too many people invest in equities or real estate and that money is put into those longer-term asset pools, then there's less money in people's back pockets and less spending. If there's less spending, then there's less jobs. And we have to understand that uh, when we look at the Australian real estate market, for example, that our debt levels were reduced. Australia got put on a debt reduction program on real estate in 2017, 18 and 19. And we went on a bit of a savings uh, uh, process through coronavirus. People were not spending money on the social economy. So right now, it looks really good from uh, an asset value versus the cost of money versus incomes in people's banks versus uh, money in people's back pockets. The ratio looks pretty good. And that usually means real estate is going to be a bit of a winner. Real estate will be a bit of a winner. And I think the powers that be want us spending on real estate because of the big rock effect. The big rock effect is real estate has so many spin-off jobs that the economy is nourished via real estate. In other words, we're seeing things like government grants and low-cost loans that goes into real estate that creates a job. That money gets circulated into other jobs, into people buying furniture, 
into people having to move house, uh, into rates, into uh, utilities. So all of a sudden you can see that though the money is being spent, it does circulate in the economy. And that is one of the massive, massive reasons I think you're going to see the sentiment of real estate go really strong. One could argue the Central Bank of Australia and New Zealand has turned every single person who has a job into a property investor because there is no point in putting money into the bank. In fact, one step further, every single person who has half uh, a few bucks in the bank, including retirees, are now thinking of being property investors or becoming property investors. So I tell you what, there's some big trends unfolding around the globe and it is not all rosy. It is not all rosy. The real estate world, I think, is going to be pretty rosy. But here's the thing. You know, you and I have to wake up every day and play in a world economy. We are just a small little widget, folks. And there are so many different moving parts. The big worry is factoring in inflation, the cost of uh, things rising in value. And when we look at asset classes and the valuation of them, the fact that real assets like real estate will go up in value, that inflation factor is, is going to be big is going to be big. And what that really does mean is you've got $100 in your hand and real estate jumps up in value by 10%. Well, all of a sudden you need $110 to buy the exact same thing. If it jumps up by 20% per Westpac's report, you need now $120 to buy the same thing. But guess what? Your wage is not going to increase. The other big concern is the cost of goods. The cost of goods is skyrocketing, skyrocketing. You know, around the world, there is a logistics and freight uh, train wreck which has occurred. Freight and logistics is not working. Planes are not flying as they once did. 50% of flights no longer exist. So the movement of cargo is very much affected. You know, the cost to bring a 20-foot container from Asia to Sydney, uh, you know, prior to coronavirus was as low as $500 per 20-foot container. Now, it's up around $4,000 for the same container to arrive. So what does that mean? Well, I tell you what, your pair of Adidas shoes that you love for 187 bucks that you forget to clean and chuck in the bin because you think you can just go and buy another pair, well, they're about to go up. Everything is about to go up. Now, when we look at inflation, it's either the cost of goods or the cost of service. Cost of service doesn't seem to be moving because of a larger unemployment rate. If there's more people who need a job than there are jobs, then the cost of service does not rise. However, we are seeing the cost of goods rise. And this will have a pretty uh, incredible impact on, on uh, many things to do with real estate. For example, if it's now costing $4,000 per 20 foot to land tiles from China to build bathrooms then all of a sudden we need to pay more for those goods and that is eventually passed on in the inflation rate. Now, the official inflation rate is going to be low. In fact, you can tell that by government bonds, the yield curve. Uh, literally, the government is, has, has been buying bonds uh, to match a low rate for the next three years where they've positioned it at uh, the current cash rate in Australia of 0.01%. And so we pretty much can see that for the next three years that the interest rate to borrow money is going to be very low. It's not going to move. And the unofficial inflation rate of things like 
property goes up by 20% or the cost to get something to your house ha- is going to rise because the cost to move it has skyrocketed because there's not enough boats to move things. There's no planes flying around. Uh, it is going to certainly start to skyrocket. And Australia and New Zealand, from a freight level, are fairly low hierarchy economies. I mean, China has big business with the USA. China has big business with Europe. Getting um, you know, goods from, from Asia to Australia is, is not high priority. So we tend to even lack in that space. So I think we will see inflation. And I say that as a stark warning to you because your job as, uh, as really um, an, an ec- economic uh, Bedouin is to beat the economy. It is to have assets that out in, outperform inflation. And that's where we usually see real estate outperform inflation. So you probably want to get some real estate into you if you don't have it at this point in time. Now, there are so many different sort of trends which I think are unfolding for this 2021 year, right? And man, like I think a lot of us have to realize a big trend is really the Amazon effect. The Amazon effect is the idea that single conglomerate companies now control really the economy of the globe. And, you know, I work for Amazon. I have books on Amazon. Uh, I sell them through Amazon. I pay Amazon, right? And, you know, there's some interesting statistics that today around the globe, you know, people will have, you know, 11 different careers through their working life. And I think there is an assumption that, That is because people can just float along and do what they want to do and choose what they want to choose. Well, that assumption is incorrect. People will have 11 careers because jobs won't exist that uh, once did because of the Amazon effect, because major companies and technical advances are changing the economy so quickly that many people need to fight to survive. And I say that the big trend of 2021 is to upskill, upskill. Even if you're in a job right now and you feel safe, upskill. You know, I was reading the paper the other day about a guy who, uh, you know, was a, uh, he, he was a printer salesperson. And there was sort of an article about, you know, just how hard it is for him at 52 years old to go and get another job. He was a printer salesperson. Did he not connect the dots that no one prints anymore? The man should have gone out three years before he lost his job and found a new skill. The article was written, it was rather socialist, it was explaining, poor him, he can't get a job, we can't help people get work who are over 50. Hang on a minute. You're in an industry dying and you lose your job and then you start to question what is going on in the world. I say that with love. You've got to think about your world because we are now in the disruptive age. 2021 and the decade ahead is all about understanding the Amazon effect. If you're literally... uh, in an industry where it could pop and just go, uh, you know, you've got to think about upskilling. I think everyone needs to really understand that cost of goods are going to go up, cost of real estate is going to go up, money is deflating, and 2021 is teaching us Australia and New Zealand are going to be wealth economies for the right people. They are positioned that we have beaten the corona. We have won the war. Europe and America have have lost the war. They have lost the war. And, you know, one of the challenges we're going to see with the Amazon effect is wage freezes. And even government is talking about freezing super, not actually rising it in Australia to the earmark 12.5%. 
because what's the use of a pay rise that you get when you're 70 years of age? Government is saying, well, we, we've got, should we make businesses give people a pay rise they use when they're in retirement? What do we do about now? How do we get these people more money now so that they can keep up with inequality, the cost of living, the rat race, man? I am telling you, you've got to play the game. This stuff is serious. The more you're asleep to it, the more you've got a scotoma, a blind spot to the truth. Interesting watching inequality unfold. You know, there is a tipping point at the moment and the second unstated tipping point which is occurring around the world is the split of the middle class. You know, we've got literally billions of people now around the world either prospering from coronavirus or struggling. And that split is very much going to continue over the coming decade. So you've got to make sure that you're on the right side of this dilemma because for many people, it's going to be all about becoming absolutely stinking rich and whatever that means to, to those people. At the bare minimum, it's about keeping up with the rat race. You know, the world is really challenged at the moment. Trade wars are real. America and China are going toe-to-toe. They are going toe-to-toe. They're not backing down. And really, that trade war rift about who is the superpower has a lot to do with Australia. I think Australians often, I guess, question, you know, why do we even care about American politics? Why are we so interested if Donald Trump or, or Joe Biden wins the election? Well, Australia is, is very much caught between two superpowers, a major trading power of China and a major global defence power of the USA. And I, I tell you what, Australia is now caught up in trade wars with China. China has given the ultimatum to Australia, do the right thing and we will keep you rich. Do the wrong thing and we will not buy your wine. We will not buy your grain. We will not buy uh, your, your products. And of course, this is a real tension now and it's not going away. It's not going to get easy. Australia is not going to surrender its sovereign causes to the Chinese government just for money. So I tell you what, you know, things are uh, a tier. There is a two-tiered economy. We are connected to Asia more than we are connected economically to Europe or economically to America. And Asia is literally growing its middle class exponentially. By 2025, the Asian middle class is expected to be over 2 billion people. This is a massive marketplace that we're in. So I think we are blessed, but we are also, uh, you know, Many people just need to wake up and go in the right direction 2021. You know, there is trillions of dollars floating around the globe. It's your job to go and get it. I think we're seeing trends in Australia that we've never seen before. Here in Australia, we literally almost have seven prime ministers now. The prime minister of New South Wales, the prime minister of Victoria, prime minister of Western Australia... Everyone's taking control of their satellite areas, their states or their territories. And for the first time in the history of Australia, every single government, whether they conservative, labor or liberal, is spending big time. And never in the history of our country has every single government spent at once. We've typically had 50% of the country at one point uh, in a, with a conservative government and 50% of the country at one point with a Labor government. Traditionally, uh, conservatives don't spend. Uh, traditionally, Labor has a, has a spending fiscal policy as part of its 
jobs creation plan. Right now, doesn't really matter if the government is is a conservative government or a Labor government. They are all spending. They are all spending more money than we have ever seen before. And that wealth effect is going to absolutely make 2021 and 2022 all the way up really to about 2024, 25, a very prosperous time for people who buy the right asset classes and control their fiscal world really well. Smart people with the right economic underbelly are going to become really wealthy out of coronavirus. People who don't even know how to manage $1,000 are going to struggle. You know, if you don't know how to manage $1,000, what makes you think you can manage a million? So all of a sudden, that's going to create, for someone who does not know how to do that, the Amazon effect. That person now needs to go and reskill to learn how to be a money manager because otherwise the economy is dark, dark for that person. All right? Now, am I depressing everyone? I think I've depressed everyone. Don't be depressed. Make some action. Call yourself into action. You know, the Reserve or Central Bank is no longer in charge of the economy. Politicians are in charge of the economy. And I guarantee you, they want the best for you. They want you to get a job. They want you to upskill. They're putting money into tertiary education upskilling people for the economy of tomorrow. So go and do the upskill. There are literally billions of dollars floating around to grab the opportunity to go and learn a new trade or new skill or or something which is going to benefit you so you don't get beaten by the Amazon effect. You know, New South Wales state government has plans uh, to potentially abolish stamp duty and replace it with the land tax. This is going to have a, a massive effect because a lot of baby boomers have way too much money trapped in housing in Sydney. And if we can release that money by encouraging them to downsize without taxing them and half of their wealth comes out of their house and into the economy is being spent, that will create so many new jobs. That will create more work than you can poke a stick at. So there are some pretty cool plans. Victoria has just, you know, uh, just last year wavered stamp duty by 50% for buying brand new real estate. Uh, you get only have to pay, uh, you get 25% off if you're buying secondhand real estate. You know, some of these initiatives are about putting money into the government, but also creating spending to create jobs. You know, I love the Victorian government has just announced new minimum energy efficiency standards for rental properties. I'm going to talk about that actually on my next episode, which is all about the idea of the environment and what the environment is going to do to to really real estate. So there is so much happening. We've got the rise of the millennial. Millennials are all uh, literally in their 30s now, in their mid-30s, and they are the largest amount of people in society. That is huge because typically what happens when you're in your 30s, you're one step away from earning the most amount you'll ever earn as an adult. There are studies which show the prime level of your earning potential as an adult is 44 years of age. Millennials are 35. In other words, their next 10 years of work, you've got literally a huge workforce paying taxes, keeping the economy going, and on their way to earning uh, more and more money for themselves and the economy and obviously based on our economy, more spending creates more jobs, more jobs creates more revenue, more revenue creates more taxes, and again, the world goes around. However, for the next year, 2021, definitely the social economy will suffer. And I think when we look at you know, the jobless rate, a lot of it is to do with the social economy. 
airlines, cab drivers, hoteliers, travel agents, all affected in one way, shape or form around, uh, around you know, the unfortunate nature of the beast of coronavirus. So there is so many good things happening. There are so many bad things happening. You've got to sort of work your way through this puzzle. We're going to crack this code of real estate wealth. And I tell you what, a big part of cracking the code of global recovery, which is what this episode is about, the global recovery, is the vaccine. You know, we are hearing reports about the great injection which is going to come. Are you going to get injected? Well, I tell you what, uh, it is quite interesting. And I think a lot of economics is geared towards understanding how the vaccine will unfold, how quickly it can be uh, implemented, how fast the world can uh, get a uh, shot in the arm, so to speak, so that we can go back to what once was our daily lives. And I think realistically, uh, for my listeners anyway, I would suggest you give this a two-year uh, timeline. I think it's very, very hard logistically to move a vaccine around. A lot of these vaccines, for example, the Pfizer vaccine, needs to be stored at negative 70 degrees. That is virtually impossible to, uh, to literally logistically move. So there are so many uh, things to still unfold with where we're at. And I think just pinning your hopes on getting an injection in May or June, uh, while it sounds great, I think much of the world won't have that injection and will take a much longer period of time. I mean, I'm I'm a man of the Pacific. I love going to Vanuatu and Fiji and hanging out in these weird little places where literally you go to these islands and there's not even a fridge. So how are we going to get a vaccine to my mates in Tana, Vanuatu to have a shot in the arm at negative 70 degrees? It's going to take a while is what I'm saying. We're going to need all of the world to come together to bring a solution. This is going to involve armies. This is going to involve uh, medical people. This is going to be one of the biggest logistic operations the world has ever seen, vaccinating the whole entire world. And, of course, many people won't even choose to take the vaccine. There are the anti-vaxxer movement, which... Uh, you know, worry about what is being injected into our bodies and refuse to take it. Recent study suggested 60% of people would take it, 40% of people probably wouldn't take it in one way, shape or form based on their age, based on uh, potentially um, being in a childbirth section of the market, like wanting to have kids, based on beliefs, religious beliefs. So I think what we are going to find is coronavirus is here to stay. And we just need to understand that contact tracing is the future. And what is really relevant from what we experienced in 2020 is New South Wales contact tracing is world-class, world-class. The fact that Sydney a major metropolitan area with 5 million people shoved into a small landmass, contained outbreak after outbreak after outbreak by contact tracing is testament to the health regime in the New South Wales uh, state. And what is great about that is much of the world can learn from New South Wales Certainly much of Australia and New Zealand are learning from the contact tracing system of New South Wales. So I think though we're going to live with the pandemic for a while longer and certainly uh, the anti-vaxxers and, and the logistics of vaccinating the world is going to take a very long time. I think Australia's economy can rely on our contract tracing system, which is really only better in places which experience, for example, ZARS, uh, places like, you know, Taiwan, which, you know, were 
you know, warfare ready for pandemics. Australia and, and New Zealand have been able to contact trace the, the virus fairly well out of, out of the economy. And the economy and the virus do go hand in hand. You cannot continue to lock down economies and expect them to do well. So I think we can rely in 2021 that we are going to have another outbreak and we will contact management and we will work it out. And definitely for governments in Australia, you know, who have not had the New South Wales healthcare system, they are fast learning that that is the way to go. The economy won't grow, but inflation will happen in many things. The cost of goods, real estate, there will be very low population growth. And, you know, I've taught this for a long time. Australia in particular is addicted to migration economics. You grow an economy four different ways. You innovate, you increase your production, you sell your resources, or you increase your population. You put more people in your population, they spend more money, you increase your GDP. That's how population economics works. The real estate market has loved population economics because simply put, you can put more people into your population than you can build properties. Therefore, there is always an inflationary rate on supply versus demand. However, we are now seeing that completely falter. And I think being an island far away from anywhere or two islands, Australia and New Zealand, far away from anywhere is a blessing uh, in the respect that you know, we've, the, 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 you know, the travel through the country is, is not like Europe. It's not like uh, a shared economy of many different countries that, that connect together. And, um, you know, it's your right as a European citizen to jump from Romania to France. Here in Australia, we're lucky. We've, we've been able to, to quarantine the problem. However, we have closed the borders and, uh, you know, for the time being, um, there is going to be continued level of low migration into the country. You know, prior to the coronavirus, our migration economic policy was to grow by 1.5%. Now our population growth is down to a zero, as, as low as 0.2%. So we are just going sideways right now. But that's okay as well because right now we don't have a glut of real estate. We are not in coronavirus in a period where there is just too much stock about. So we're very fortunate that, for example, coronavirus didn't come to Australia in particular in, say, 2015. 2015, we had way too many properties and you stop the population intake you're going to have a problem of literally tens of thousands of properties built that are not sold. That is not the case. There is no stock. Stock has fallen off a cliff. There is no real estate being produced. Government is doing their best to stimulate the production of real estate uh, through all sorts of incentives. Uh, stamp duty concessions in Victoria to uh, just last year, you know, the federal government had their $25,000 home builder boost. So, so many stimulants to get the economy moving. And I think what we will see is the jobless rate start to drop. I think we're going to start to see a correction in people going back to work. Remember, the recovery is a V-shaped recovery. It obviously plummeted, but it's climbing up pretty rapidly. And prior to coronavirus in Australia, the targeted jobless rate to stimulate inflation was 4%. Now, I think a good jobless rate is more like 7%. And I think you will find if we don't run into a major, major problem with a huge uh, outbreak of coronavirus between now and vaccine, we're going to have a fairly steady jobless rate with the social economy being impacted the most. 
social economy being things like hotels and uh, and certainly um, air travel, um, obviously international tourists coming, that social connectivity. So if the real estate market is going to go up and the cost of goods are going to go up, the cost of living is going to go up. So does that pose the question, is there going to be a lending bubble? Is there going to be a lending bubble? And government needs to be very, I guess, mindful of lending bubbles in the respect that they create an artificial inflation rate, which the most citizens can't keep up with the cost of living. And what a bubble does do is it means people stop spending. In other words, they put too much money in the housing market so they don't have any money to go to the restaurant. Because they put too much money in the housing market and they can't go to the restaurant, then the person in the restaurant can't make any money. So the economy starts to falter. Will there be a lending bubble? Well, for a start, I think debt levels are very uh, mani- uh, are far more managed in the Australian property market than before. And the recent debt reduction program of 2017, 18, 19 and 20 has created lower debt levels. And when APRA introduced interest or, or basically the termination of interest-only loans, it was targeting investors. What we are seeing is the real estate market right now is not being led by investors getting investor home loans. It is led by home buyers getting home loans. And because home buyers are getting home loans, there is really not a concern around a bubble. So in other words, we can see growth without the need for APRA and potentially the government to step in and basically stop that growth. So I do believe the next two years, the recovery in particular with real estate is going to lead to capital growth. After that, we're probably going to have to reassess things. Three years interest rates will literally be at record low levels. So you don't have to worry about an interest rate rise. You do have to worry about a capital growth rise. You're going to get capital growth. Real assets like real estate are anchored to the cost of money. You're going to see it go up. And really, you're probably going to see potentially yields, rental returns, drop, drop not rise, drop, not exponentially, but the cost of money is so low, so many people are going to leave the rental market and become homeowners. And of course, that is a very good thing for obviously uh, your back pocket if you own real estate, because if someone else pays more for for it, uh, it tends to go up. And we, we obviously want that as a property investor as well. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed the show today. I've certainly enjoyed you bringing the 2021 Road to Recovery. Hey, take care, have some fun, and I will talk to you again soon. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media, over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.